You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number 40. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey, you. Welcome back. I'm Jill Castle host of the Nourish Child Podcast, which is a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of raising healthy ones inside and out. Sports season has kicked into high gear, and I know many of you are swept up in the excitement of games and competition. This month, I'm interviewing an Olympian and the queen of sports nutrition on my podcast. My hope is that it will motivate you to hit a home run with your athlete's nutrition this season. Remember, I've got tons of resources on my site, from my book, Eat Like a Champion, to e-cookbooks that help you make winning meals for your athlete. You can find them over on my website, www.jillcastle.com, under the Books tab. And I'll be on the TEDx stage in Danbury, Connecticut, on October 5th. Come on out and join the audience. I'd love to see you there. Tickets are available at www.tedxdanbury.com. That's D-A-N-B-U-R-Y.com. And as with all TEDx events, seating is limited, so grab your tickets early. Last, I'm part of a parenting podcast network called Parents on Demand, P-O-D, Parents on Demand. I've been scouting around and listening to the other podcasts in the network and wanted to share one with you today called The Lean Green Dad. Listen to this. Fruits and veggies. We know we're supposed to eat them as parents, but getting our kids to eat them and try new things? Not so easy. Hi, my name's Corey, and welcome to Lean Green Dad Radio. I'm a husband, a father, and a plant-based athlete, and each week I get to talk to some of the most incredible folks I can find to help me stay fit, eat healthy, and really get the most out of life as a busy parent. Be sure to visit us online at leangreendad.com and keep going that extra mile for your family. Today I'm talking to Dan Walsh. Dan is a U.S. national rower and an Olympian. I invited Dan to come on the show because I've always been impressed with his attention to nutrition. As a coach of young rowers, Dan hammers home the importance of nutrition for training and competition and sends the message to his rowers that nutrition is vital to their success. So a little bit about Dan. Dan spent 11 years on the U.S. Rowing Senior National Team. He won a bronze medal in the 2006 World Championships, and he has won two Olympic medals. He is currently one of the rowing coaches at Maritime Rowing Club in Norwalk, Connecticut. Dan definitely embodies the notion of, if you work hard, your dreams can come true. Dan will share his very interesting and amazing story with us today, as well as his perspective on nutrition as a key element to athletic performance. You can find today's show notes with all the links I mentioned over at jillcastle.com forward slash 040. That's 040 for episode number 40. So, okay, let's do this. Hey, Dan, welcome to the Nourish Child podcast. Thanks, Jill. I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited to have you on the show. I know that you're going to have a lot of pearls of wisdom for the parents who are listening, particularly parents of young athletes. And um, I'm just I'm just excited to have you and to hear your story. So you are dot dot dot. This is where you get to fill it in. <laughs> well, uh, I am currently a parent of a about to be two year old. So dealing with the uh, fun and adventure of Every single day is it's a different eating behavior. Oh, yeah. But my personal story where I am now is I am a rowing coach of a high school and master's team. And I got into rowing coaching by being a 12-year national team member, a a two-time Olympian, Olympic medalist, Division I college rower, high school rower, and high school wrestler. So with all that background in sports, especially two demanding sports like wrestling and rowing, I realized that nutrition was the one thing that I could 100% control. 
Mm. Uh, whatever I put into my body was going to be a choice. And if I could use that for an advantage, then I was going to the best of my ability. Hmm. When did when did you discover that nutrition was such an important uh, thing that you could control? Well, I think for me, I, a lot of it came from my mother. Now, she was she grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, both my parents were high school dropouts. So it wasn't like in the middle of the city, there was a whole lot of information or internet or anything like that on what fuels a good athlete. You know, the fact that I was even going to be athletic was a surprise to my family because mm. if you were to ask any of them when I was 12 years old that I would be a world-class athlete, they would have bet against you. <laughs> <laughs> Why is oh. that? Why is that? <laughs> uh, well, the, uh, the 245 pound frame that I, I carry around now was once a, you know, very gangly and not as tall and not as an athletic frame. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a big joke that when I played basketball and soccer, I was the furthest kid away from the ball. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I digress by humiliating myself um, versus complimenting my mom. She, my dad was an underwater uh, construction for mm -hmm. a long time, way before I was born. Um, I'm the youngest of four by nine years. The closest sibling is my brother, who's nine years older than me. Wow. And the three of them are Irish triplets, one, two, three. Mm. And when they, my dad's jobs took them all over the world. They lived in Singapore for a year. They were in Hawaii. They were in the South. They were in California. They were in Alaska. And my mom was always adventurous, especially with food. Hmm. And so by the time they settled in Norwalk, where, you know, I live now and my parents lived um, until, you know, until recently, she would always experiment with food and it was food that made you feel good. And so from the traditional kind of Scots-Irish broken culture of, you know, you, you eat what's in front of you, meat and potatoes type of thing. Mm -hmm. She was experimenting with greens, arugula, farmer's markets, you know, what's a star fruit, what's a dragon fruit, mm -hmm. uh, going to the Chinese market and trying different herbs, trying different spices. Let's try Indian food. Let's go get sushi. So to me, my mom's ability to be exploratory with food was kind of the beginning of me realizing that there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. You know, mm -hmm. if, if your kid doesn't like this type of fish, why don't you try so? You know, there's all kinds of different ways to get somebody to eat. Now, as that skinny frame started to fill out and required more food, <laughs> um, she eventually was like, all right, if my dinner that I cooked for you wasn't good enough, kid, you got to learn to cook for yourself. There you go. So around the age of nine, she actually introduced me to the kitchen and taught me how to prepare food for myself. And I got to start experimenting there. And then when that appetite got even bigger... It was like, well, we're not going to pay for this food bill, so you're going to go work at a restaurant or a deli <laughs> somewhere that they will feed you. Um, I really say. like your mom, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so then I got access to preparing food at a professional level and kind of seeing how it worked on the commercial side too. Um, the I guess that's kind of the practical side of nutrition for me. Mm -hmm. Then my strong suits in school were always uh, science. So chemistry, physics, biology, and I had a huge affinity to biology. Mm. And there, when we got into human anatomy and physiology and starting to learn about the Krebs cycle and how, you know, the cells and the mitochondria and, you know, we won't go in, we won't exhaust our, our listeners with the science of it. <laughs> but I started to realize that you are what you eat. That old adage holds a lot of truth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you put the way I talk to my athletes now is like, look, if you put sugar in your gas tank, your engine's not going to run. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I wanted to start to figure out what was going to really help me become a better athlete, you know, starting a food journal in the sense, if I eat this, do I feel better or do I not? Mm -hmm. Um, and so in high school, I decided to stop drinking soda because I, you know, found out that carbonation wasn't good for you. It could slow recovery of your muscles. Um, I slowed down really big on my dairy intake because, you know, I read, and this again, I'm sure science has changed since then, but just finding out that lactose or too much of it can make you feel lethargic or mucusy or help you build mucus, which is the last thing an endurance athlete or wrestler wants to have. Um, finding out like creatine is in red meat, but you want to make sure your red meat is high quality and you don't have to overdo it. And then even going as far as looking at, okay, what different animals in the animal kingdom are strong and fast? You know, what are they, you know, what are they eating? You know, mm -hmm. you have your gorillas and your elephants that are all vegetarians, but then you have your lions and tigers who are, you know, carnivores. So mm -hmm. us being lucky enough to be on omnivores, how can we balance that? Mm -hmm. um, and then the big growth spurt 
in high school happened where I went from under six feet and 140 pounds to above six feet and 185 pounds. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so, <laughs> that must have been a fun time for your mom. Yeah, or it and was, you. <laughs> it, it was interesting. It was fun, and that's when my athleticism kind of really took off as well. And I started having these dreams of becoming an Olympian, and mm. with that, I started looking into what are elite athletes doing to make themselves fueled. And so that led into college where I got a scholarship to Northeastern. Um, I studied athletic training and physiology. We had mandatory courses in nutrition there. So I got to learn a little bit more about it at a scientific level. Um, made some errors too. You know, it is college. So you, mm-hmm. you learn to indulge in not necessarily the right things. And back then, cafeterias weren't necessarily a beacon of proper nutrition. Right. But I learned to outsource. I learned to realize that instead of getting a meal plan, I'm going to have to spend more money on fruits, vegetables, um, you know, whatever my diet required, I was going to have to invest in if I wanted to be a type athlete. Mm -hmm. So again, trying to go back is you have, if you're an athlete or if you're the parent of the athlete, diet is the one thing that you can learn to control. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean it comes easy because the biggest, biggest thing that I have to I think to your listeners and what I say to my athletes, if the food's going to make you perform better and you don't like it, it's the same thing as doing squats. It's the same thing as running. If it's going to make you better and you don't like it, does that stop you from doing squats or does that stop you from running? So if salmon is going to give you all the good you know, fatty acids that you need and the right type of protein, but you hate fish, you better train your palate just like you train your legs. Oh, such a great analogy. Yeah. And that was the toughest thing for me because- Culturally, again, coming from a very you know large male, I had five uncles on my mom's side, one or on my dad's side, one of my mom's, all big guys, crushing the entire apple pie at Thanksgiving <laughs> was a badge of honor. You know, being able to eat a pound and a half of pasta in a sitting was a badge of honor. You know, overindulging in necessarily the wrong foods was like you, you know you're manly, you get big, like look at your arms and your shoulders. Mm-hmm. So that competitive edge of eating the wrong stuff and you know having that pint of ice cream and being able to eat the whole thing that has been my challenge Mm -hmm. um you know you put a pint of ice cream in front of me not only do i want to eat it because i can but who leaves half a pint of ice cream (laughs) (laughs) it's the whole psychology behind eating it's not just you know i often times uh when i talk to my parents in my practice it's you know i'm really talking about the psychology of eating because you have a two-year-old um you know what you know, types of foods you want her to eat. We've got parents who have athletes. They know what their children should be eating. It's not real. It's half of it is about knowing that's what they need to eat. The other half is actually getting their skin in the game and their motivation to make those choices, which is really much more difficult. Yeah. And that, I mean, especially if you think about culturally where your relationship with food started, Mm -hmm. Um, because if there's a, you know, if eating, for example, my family, if eating the whole entire apple pie is giving you positive reinforcement for those people that you look up to, it's really hard to rewire your brain as an adult not to do that. And then you take the athlete's idea of it where completion of a task is a reward. Mm-hmm. You know, you see food as a completion of a task. At least that's how myself and then all my elite rowers see it. It's Hey, there's an eating contest of, you know, if can two guys eat a 50 inch pizza? Well, we're not going to lose that contest. Right. And then you overindulge in pizza. Right. Um, you know, can you eat the Vermonster from Ben and Jerry's, which is 20 scoops of ice creams? You know, hell yeah, I can't. You know, so right. yeah. it's when you're, to- when you're dealing with your athlete, I think it's the mindfulness of what you're eating. And as much as that may be a, you know, um, a trendy, a trendy way to describe food right now. It's the same way as an athlete has to train. And that's why I say like training your palate has to be the same way you train your body is sometimes monotony is the best thing where it's like you're eating oatmeal and peanut butter every morning with a banana because you know it's good no matter how bored you are. Um, You know, you're eating a lean protein for lunch and you're eating a, you know, a high veggie based dinner, like eat the same thing for 30 days. It may, it may be very boring, may be frustrating, but if you're getting the right nutrients, macro and micro, in your system and it's making you a better athlete that's the that is one of the things that athletes have to embrace is you're not going to lead a normal normal life your normal social circles are going to think you're weird (laughs) and 
sometimes you have to do things that are just plain boring and dull. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and food is a very social aspect, particularly of of uh, teenagers' lives. Right, because it's their first, you know, going out to get food or going out for lunch or you know the hitting up McDonald's, your favorite deli or ice cream shop. It's it's part of the teenage rite of passage. And then I'm sure I'm not the only teenager whose parents were like, my food bill's too high. You're going to go work in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I have a rower and he eats like crazy and I, I'm sure all his friends do as well. And it does become uh, a lot of labor and a lot of expense. And I think for any sport, really, uh, particularly a sport in the teenage years, when kids are really having that growth sc- Bert, that you described earlier, it's it's a job to feed these athletes. Yeah, and it's I think the athletes have to also realize. I mean, you talked about your son being a rower. You know, I was a wrestler. Sometimes the extreme, you know, the extreme polarization of certain sports, like season, you know, seasonality. Like in rowing, it was all about trying to fill into your body, and wrestling it was about making weight. And you know, that's one of the biggest mistakes I made as an athlete. With you know, there wasn't proper guidance because it was high school wrestling, and it was also my own ego. I had naturally weighed 185 pounds my junior year. I had another growth spurt to going to my senior year, and I weighed closer to 200. But I want to defend my 189 pound title. Mm-hmm. Um, if I would have just let my body continue to grow, I probably would have gotten to 205 and been healthy by mm-hmm. the end of the wrestling season. I was emaciated. I look at pictures from you know our all state team, and. I look gaunt, you know, pale, my cheeks are sucked in, and I'm just thinking, how was I expecting to perform at a high level after losing close to 10 pounds on average a week? Yeah. Um, So, you know, that's the biggest thing with, like, podcasts like yours, the internet, um, resources all over the place for today's parents and athletes, ask questions. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, try and help your athletes separate their ego from their diet, because it's really hard between the social norms you grow up with with eating the pie to the demands that the athlete puts of themselves to what they think is right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure is, you know, bulking up in high school, a huge, you know, a huge factor. Bulking up is great. Eating has got to be a job. You got to leave the place full. But so many athletes tend to think like, oh, well, if I'm going to bulk up, I can eat whatever I want. And then they're saturating their bodies with protein. They're saturating their bodies with saturated fats. They're eating all the wrong foods. Um, because it's too hard to try and get 3,000 calories of spinach in a day. Mm, yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I see, you know, I, I work with, I've worked with rowers, but I also work, I've worked with a lot of swimmers. Um, I write for USA Swimming, and I used to write for U.S. Rowing as well. And so it, it is a window into the myriad mistakes that these young athletes make. You you mentioned one, loading up on protein. I think that's probably one of the most common mistakes that I see young athletes making because they think that protein is the um, holy grail of athleticism. And what they don't realize oftentimes is that too much of anything is not a good thing. And it can really, you know, contribute to dehydration and uh, extra weight gain that they don't want because, you know, we don't store protein. We develop muscles, but we don't store protein. So when you eat beyond what your body needs, you convert it to fat and you store it in that in that way. Um, so it's very interesting. I'm curious, uh, Dan, as a coach, and you've been coaching for a number of years now, uh, what are some of the typical mistakes that you're seeing amongst your athletes? The first and foremost is buying anything off the commercial discount shelf of GNC. Mm. Um, my my biggest pet peeve is, is supplements. I think there is a small place for it. Uh, I'm sure I know you know this. The the most of your listeners will know, but for some of the parents that don't, you know, supplements are not regulated by the FDA. Mm-hmm. As an elite athlete, we were adamantly by USADA, which is the anti-doping agency in the U.S., not to use supplementation because of all the risks of if there are, perform, you know, for us, if there was performance-enhancing drugs hidden in there, so especially anything that says, we'll make you stronger, make you faster, increase recovery, blah, 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 
um, chances are they're hiding something illegal in there, mm -hmm. to heavy metal contamination, to allergens, to the list goes on and on. Um, you know, the only thing that I ever used in terms of protein was a grass-fed whey protein mm -hmm. that I used the normal serving size per day. Mm -hmm. That was it. So as a you know, again as a big guy, I can't remember the last time my daily living only cost two thousand calories. <laughs> I right. Think, I think I've been above three thousand oh, since yeah. the time I was sixteen. Oh, I'm um, sure. Yeah. I use one scope, one scoop of grass-fed whey protein. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. So if you have a kid that's eating five scoops of the normal protein, they're doing you know, they're, it's just too much. It's too much pressure on your kidneys. As you said, we pee out whatever left over of our amino acids and proteins, um, along with being dehydrated, along with all the other stuff that goes on with being an athlete. You don't need that much strain. You'd be better off trying to find your protein, in my opinion, you know, through legumes or you know some your you know your again your fish or um, avocado and getting a little fat in there with some you know good fats. Mm -hmm. All the stuff that is out there in natural food. Right. Um, and in today's again in today's marketplace, you can get seasonal food year round. There really there really isn't a big excuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a food first girl. That's a philosophy I have. I've always had. And even if you're, you know, an elite athlete, I'm going to try to help uh, plan a diet that's going to be based in real food first. And if we can't do it with real food, then we fill in the gaps in other ways. But food is food is so much more pleasurable too and satisfying and i think people forget about that they eat these you know protein drinks or these bars or and they you know then they pig out at the end of the night cuz truly they're not satisfied they haven't really you know reached a level of oh i'm full i'm satisfied i've had great nutrition all day um when they do bars and i there's i don't have anything against bars but uh, when you base your diet largely on these alternative foods, uh, you know, there's this level of satisfaction that gets missed. And we're always going to psychologically be impacted by that and perhaps want to overindulge to make up for that later on. Right. And, it, and if you're an endurance athlete, that craving for a quick fix in terms of your food you know, you're going to always reach for the quickest thing. And it goes back to, I think, the behavior of like training your palate or training your behaviors for food. If you have your house full of bars or supplements or shakes, your athlete is always going to gravitate towards that mm -hmm. versus having peaches, you know, avocados. Um, you know, if you're going to have like snacks in there, a, you know, a beef jerky or you know, they're, mm -hmm. If your athlete says they don't like it, tell them to train their palate. <laughs> I love it. I love that. I'm going to start using that. Train your palate. I love it. Yeah. Now, um, what other that, mistakes do you see, Dan? Have you seen other? I love that you said supplements because that's a pet peeve of mine too. And uh, it's a real danger uh, these days. Even even the energy drinks are so dangerous for athletes at this point. Yeah, especially since the, the energy drinks are just – getting their big kick mostly out of sugar and caffeine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, go get a venti from Starbucks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like, and even then, you know, you have to, caffeine tolerance is a, is a, is an individualized thing. If you don't drink coffee, but all of a sudden you're taking, you know, these Enduro Max 5000s and it says, oh, equivalent to about two cups of coffee. Well, two cups of coffee from Starbucks could be 400 milligrams, whereas from Dunkin' Donuts could be 600 from your local barista could be a fat. You just don't know. Right. So, Better safe than sorry. Yeah. It's like if you want to try and experimenting with caffeine, which I have done, I don't think it's bad. Start by having a very small espresso and seeing how it affects your body. Mm -hmm. if you're a good athlete. You monitor it. You say, made me feel jittery, made me feel alive, made me feel the acid hurt my stomach. Um, you have to document your things. You can't, every athlete is different. So, right. which kind of takes me to my next point. Like the other biggest mistake I see is the carbo loading to me myth that's left over from 1970s running, mm -hmm. which is you try and eat your body weight in a simple, you know, a, 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 a disaccharide pasta, you know, mm -hmm. bleached, bleached flour pasta. Um, or, you know, the night before. Pasta. Yeah. And, the amount of bloat, lethar like you're lethargic, the insulin goes up, all the things you don't want as an athlete to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and especially for rowers, rowers 
we are an endurance sport I and mean, we do use our aerobic system. We do rely on like glycolysis. We do, you know, take glycogen out of our liver and our muscles, but we are also very anaerobic. Mm-hmm. And the last thing we want is that, that stress response from an insulin spike that's storing everything to fat. And then glycolysis has to come in the next morning and all of a sudden switch gears. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of, you know, pre like the night before a little bit of protein, good amount of veggies to what your body can handle for the fiber, very small carbohydrate base, whether it is a pasta or rice or even better, some good meaty fruits, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's like to me, if that makes you feel good and you go to bed a little bit hungry, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Going to going to bed bloated and full and feeling like you can't move, that's a really bad sign. Okay, so let's follow this up. If you had uh, a teenage athlete, a teenage rower, we'll talk rowing specific because you are a rowing coach, what would you tell uh, your athletes the night before they're going to nationals? What would you tell them to eat? If you had to be specific, say you were there, you're obviously their coach, but let's say you're their parent and you're going to make your son or your daughter uh, and it would be different for a son and a daughter, obviously. But let's say your son, you're going to make your son uh, dinner the night before he's competing in the morning. What would you ideally outline for that? So I would probably do a two vegetables, which would be like a broccoli and an asparagus um, type of thing with on a bed of green leafy vegetables with some color, like whether it's peppers, tomatoes, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, to give them that kind of fiber to make them feel full, but also not to get too specific, help move everything along in the morning Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you want to, you want to have a clear system. Um, you want to be empty. (laughs) Yes. Uh, you want, you want to, but also it's like you're looking at a lot of green there. So a lot of vitamin B, folic acid, all that stuff that's going to help this, you know, help the system. Mm -hmm. I personally would try and get a really high quality lean red meat Mm -hmm. in them. Um, because they're going to have muscle breakdown from the race and having creatine in their system will help the recovery. Mm-hmm. And then I would look to see if there is a, you know, like a, a wild rice option, um, maybe a, you know, sweet potato or roasted potato type of option. If mm-hmm. not, like I said, a smaller serving of, of protein uh, or of, of a carbohydrate mm-hmm. or with a, you know, a fruit salad. Mm-hmm. Um, so it sounds the, like a blend of starchy carbs, the potato and a and um, more uh, vegetable fruit carbs in addition to that. Yeah, or you know, a quinoa gr- is great. Mm-hmm. Um, if they had a sensitive stomach or they didn't want to do the red meat, I would look into an egg option. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think you know, I think a small amount of protein the night before a race is, is is good because what what happens is like we go down to the psychology of it again. Your your brain knows you're racing. Mm-hmm. You go to sleep stressed. Mm. I mean, very few athletes sleep through the night. Either they're excited, they're nervous, they're scared, or all of the above throughout the course of the night. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, athletes usually wake up before their alarm on race day. Um, me and my teammates used to call it warrior sleep. When you know you're going into battle, like as soon as the sun rises or you get up five minutes before your alarm. Mm. So your body is ready to go, which means to me, you know, it's already trying to use those nutrients in a flight or fight response. Mm-hmm. You know, your cortisol is up, so you need to make sure that your body, you know, it's going into breakdown repair mode, breakdown repair mode right there and then. So if you eat heavy or you eat, um, you know, too much on the lethargic side of food, because you can ask anybody, they eat too much, you know, they eat too much pasta, they eat too much pizza, they eat too much ice cream, they feel lethargic. Mm-hmm. So if you eat, to me, if you eat kind of that that Spartan meal, you're going to be ready for that warrior sleep and your body's going to be engaged where in the morning you have your oatmeal, your banana, you know, you're some type of carbohydrate because you will be racing in, you know, hopefully three hours Mm -hmm. that your body is going to use that sugar right away. Right. Makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I mean, fit, like, again, you could substitute the, if you're, if you're anti red meat, I think, uh, any type of protein, animal protein in that place is good Mm -hmm. because, there is going to be some of that muscle broke breakdown and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but animal protein is usually still some of the best for muscle rebuilding. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. So, okay. So we, we talked about protein. We've talked about supplements. uh, We talked about carb loading, anything else in terms of mistakes that you're seeing uh, young athletes make about nutrition? Um, 
lack of hydration. Good one. You know, I think that's the they missed they misjudge what it means to be hydrated. They're they wait till they're thirsty to drink. Um, they overdo their drinking before a big event. So then again, all they're doing is starting to you know urinate out all those good. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, I'm trying to think of a one of our athletes at a world championships um, found out that one of the coaching staff was trying a I'm chugging a Nalgene of uh, water every morning to make sure I'm heart hydrated. Mm-hmm. Now this coach happened to be an uh, Olympic gold medalist when they were a rower at one time, so everything that came out of his mouth was gospel. Mm-hmm. So the athlete at the world championships decides to try doing this without telling anybody. Now mm-hmm. his body wasn't ready for it, and because of he was stressed, because he had all you know the flight or fight response, and because he still then continued to drink water like most athletes do nervously throughout the day. Mm-hmm. By the end of the race, he had you know you get so hot when you're a rower. He had no electrolytes in the system because he was urinating so much. Mm. So massive headache, cramping, all mm. these factors that he never had before. He's like, I don't know what happened. We found out how much water he drank. Mm. And it was like, if you're flushing your system with that much water, you're going to deplete a lot of those other you know, micronutrients, electrolytes, et cetera, that you need. Right. So hy- hydration, whether it's too much or too little, athletes don't have a really good scope of what to do. Mm-hmm. What's your stance on sports drinks for an extra little boost of electrolytes? Um, you know, I'm a big fan of using a banana and eating, you know, again, eating your food. So, like, mm-hmm. if you like a banana and you have a piece of beef jerky, you're going to get your potassium salt that way versus a sugary drink in your system, mm-hmm. which is going to get absorbed much faster, whereas the fiber in the banana and the des- denseness of the beef jerky, it's going to slow the absorption and give you a better kick. Mm-hmm. Um, if you need it, Obviously, it's 90 degrees, you've been sweating your face off, you're just depleted, you need that quick absorption. Right. So um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of sports drinks to an extent. I don't think that that should be the first thing an athlete reaches for. Right. I agree. I, I think there's a time and a place, uh, but that's not very often. That There's yep. a lot of different ways that you can manage that. So I'm curious, and I, I just kind of want to go back to your story for a, just a quick um, – Second, how did you make the switch from wrestling to rowing? For life, for life, or just between the seasons? Well, just for life. Yeah, I mean, I don't think of Dan Walsh, wrestler. I think Dan <laughs> Walsh, rower. <laughs> um, luck, it, some of it's luck, and some of it's misfortune, depending on how you're looking at it. But <laughs> I was a huge combat sport fan when I was in high school. Um, Wrestling was a school sport, so it was an easy way to get my mom to let me do it. Mm-hmm. Versus signing up for karate or in martial arts was violent. Mm. Little, little did she know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the um, the biggest switch came from as my senior year, I blew out my shoulder, oh. and you know I knew I wanted to be an Olympian. I was ready to go for it in either sport. But at the state championships in the semifinal, I dis well, I subluxated my shoulder, which. For anyone that doesn't know orthopedics, it's when your joint dislocates, but it relocates itself. You don't need a doctor or an athletic trainer or a physical therapist to pop it back in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wound up losing that match by one point, and then I was dumb enough to wrestle another match to qualify for New England's, which was the next step in qualifying for nationals, and it subluxed two more times in that match. So oh. I did win. I did win. Oh, so, wow. Um, but... At that point, I couldn't use my left arm really for anything. Uh, mm. My dad said if he could have gotten to the stands fast enough, he would have stopped the match because at one point it looked like I was passed out on the mat when it popped out and in. Oh, jeez. So, you know, not anything a parent really wants to hear. And now that I say that, thinking of Stella doing <laughs> something, I'm like, oh, gosh. What am I <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, went to the orthopedic. They said, look, if you want to make wrestling a career, you would need surgery. If not, you can try physical therapy for three weeks and get better. Hmm. So at that point, it was like, okay, we're not wrestling at the um, New Englands. We're not wrestling at Nationals. So wrestling's out of the picture. Went to the physical therapist, and they said, here's the exercise that you need to do to strengthen your shoulder. And lo and behold, the rowing motion with the arms was one of them. Oh, wow. At this point, I had already been rowing since middle school. It was my senior year. Um... I had already been accepted to Northeastern, 
and I was trying to make the junior national team. And right there and then I said, I'm making this junior national team come hell or high water. And I just started training on the erg. And then once my shoulder was better, I got in the boat, pulled the time fast enough to make the junior team, and then went to camp, made it, and kind of that was the beginning. That's great. And yeah. then, and then what happened? And then I went to college and gained another forty pounds and grew two inches. <laughs> so, so for listeners out here who might not know who you are, give us the stats. How tall are you? And I mean, because you're you're a big athlete. Yeah. So the right now I'm about six seven and pushing between 240 to 245 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, my training has changed a little bit to being a dad bod and, <laughs> and, 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 and heavy, heavy weightlifting. But when I was on the Olympic team, I was still the same height and about 225 pounds to 217. Mm-hmm. Um, I kept that wrestler's edge when I raced. You know, I didn't ever suck weight to below what was healthy, mm-hmm. but I always wanted to be as low body fat as I could. So I knew my power to weight ratio was at its maximum. Mm-hmm. So for, for, for those people that know rowing is very much a power to weight ratio. Whereas if you create 300 Watts of power, that's great. But if your body weight is so heavy that you're only really moving 250 Watts, then you have, you know, 300, 50 pounds is dead weight. Mm. So I always wanted to just be when we raced right on the line of making sure I was as low as as low weight as possible without risking any nutritional deficits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the winter time, I would get up to about two twenty five to have a little bit of fat on me to stave off any injury or sickness. Mm-hmm. And then after college, you went to the national team. Is that when you went on to the national yep. team? Yeah, my senior year. Um, I get, so there's a in between the junior team and the senior team. There's a step called the U twenty threes. And I got invited to camp for that one, missed making the team in 1999. Uh, I had to take summer classes in 2000. Actually, though, at Northeastern, it's a five-year school and has co-ops, so every every major has to take summer classes. And that was actually when I did my nutrition cl- uh, coursework. Mm-hmm. So Was that class time, hard? Um, it was difficult, but because I enjoyed it, it wasn't too bad. I still remember to this day. Not because I didn't study as hard as I should have when our carries also can known as cavities. And I said, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I never, I never messed that one up ever again. <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah. But, um, it was, you know, I got an A. So I had that, I had that going for me. But again, I knew that knowledge was going to, the whole reason why I got into athletic training and exercise physiology is I wanted to try and cut out the middleman. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was my body. I knew it best. So, if I wanted to be able to identify any problems that were coming in physically, emotionally, or mentally, and then if I felt like I needed help, I could reach out to a practitioner. Mm-hmm. Um, have these conversations where how many athletes I've had come up to me when I was a student athletic trainer saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. And then you got to go through. It was nice to be able to go in and saying, you know, the medial side of my hamstring really hurts. It feels like it's at the insertion point right by the knee. I did it when I was doing a really heavy squat. I just want to see if it's a grade two sprain. Mm-hmm. Then the practitioner's like, okay, let's get to work. You know, it just mm-hmm. saves time, effort, and communication was better. Sure. But to continue the path line, in 2001, I got invited to go to the senior team camp um, and made it. So I was one of four college guys that made the senior team that year. And then from 2001 all the way to 2012, I was on the national team. And that was my... That was my living. So I'm green and don't really understand what it means to be on the national team. So for almost 12 years, you were on this team. What, is, what does that mean? Like every day you're, you know, up and, and training every day. Did you work? Did you or did they? I mean, what does that mean to be on the national team? So I, I, I sum it up. So the national team is um, – if there's a world championships every year, there's not an Olympics. Mm-hmm. So the Olympics is all the sports world championships in one event, which is why it's so incredible. But from, so let's say from 2001 to 2003, those are world championships. So they're like, you know, it's still rowing and it's still like the Olympics because it's the world racing against each other. Um, it's just that it's only rowing. Mm-hmm. So every year I was training for some type of world championship event and it was full time, you know, two to three practices a day seven days a week, uh, no real vacations, not going to see, you know, missing christenings, weddings, funerals, graduation parties, 
um, really you just become in your foxhole with your teammates who are trying to become Olympic medalists. Mm -hmm. And the, the job front, there were a couple different Olympic sponsors like Home Depot had one for a little while where if you worked a certain amount of hours a week, they would pay you for 40. Um, and they helped you with travel expenses and stuff like that. We trained mostly in Princeton, New Jersey from the spring to the fall mm -hmm. and then Chula Vista, California, which is just south of um, San Diego in the winters. And so you would, if you were lucky, you found a job that would allow you to travel. And then you have, you know, a month of the year was the world championships because you would travel to acclimate to your new environment, do your race prep there. And then the racing was usually, uh, you know, seven to eight days. Um, and then you add all other international races peppered in there throughout the year. So it is a, it's an all or nothing thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it was some of the best, best moments of my life happened there. Mm, I bet. I bet. So now you're a coach and uh, you've been working either rowing or working in the sport of rowing now for a very long time. What advice, and this will be our, our wrap up question, but what advice would you have for parents of young athletes, young rowers who are getting into the sport and uh, want to enjoy the sport, but also may be serious about the sport? As a coach, what, what would be your advice? The biggest, biggest thing you have to do for the parent of the rower, and you can have the pun intended, but help them keep an even keel. Mm -hmm. The you know, Rowing in a lot of ways is a meritocracy where if you work really hard and harder than the person next to you, you will advance. But it is a grueling sport. It takes a lot of mileage a lot of erging, a lot of rowing, a lot of weights to start to be able to get good. And sometimes it takes a year to see an improvement in your results. And so for a parent, you can't have the instant gratification or feed into your kids into instant gratification into that sport. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't compare Billy versus Johnny or Susie versus Debbie from year to year because all kids hit their growth spurts at different ages. So, one kid may all of a sudden get exponentially faster because they grew that six inches in the year. They put on that 10 pounds of muscle while the other kid is still trying to catch up or just might not catch up because his parents are only five foot five and the other kid's parents are six foot five. But the one thing that rowing will do is it will separate your child from every other sport and every other demographic because of that meritocracy. They will learn to work hard. They will learn to persevere. They will learn to fail and pick themselves up. They will learn how to be confrontational on the water with one of their best friends and then give them a hug when the racing is all done and then make a boat go fast with them the next day. It is a sport that prepares you for the grittiness of life better than anything I've ever experienced. And I've played football. I've played basketball. I've wrestled. I've done jujitsu. Um, I've had friends that have done other sports and rode and nothing quite seems to just make you gritty like rowing. Wonderful. Dan Walsh. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Jill, it's been a pleasure. I always love to talk nutrition. And one thing I wanted to say is ice cream does make you strong. Just be, <laughs> just be careful about how much you eat. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And uh, you are at walshrowing.com. Correct. I will include that and your social media handles in the show notes so everybody can find you. And uh, they can always find you at Maritime Rowing in Norwalk, Connecticut. Yep. If they ever want to, parents, if you ever want to get into the grittiness of rowing, it's never too late. There'll be somebody 90 years old racing at the head of the trials this year. So there. no excuses. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. All right. Take care, Jill. Okay, folks, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Dan Walsh. It was certainly entertaining for me. And uh, again, I so appreciate any coach out there who sheds the necessary and important light on nutrition as a game changer for so many of our young athletes who are not only looking to perform well uh, in their sport, but also to grow well. I think that sometimes we lose that notion or that perspective that a lot of these kids are still growing and they need that fuel to grow well as well as to perform well. 
So I hope today, um, if you like the show, you can help the Nourish Child podcast grow, uh, especially if you can write a review on iTunes. That's always great. It can uh, really help other families, other parents, even coaches, uh, professionals even, find the Nourish Child podcast. You can also subscribe to the show on iTunes, Android, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, Tuned In, and more. All the links are on my website under the podcast button. And certainly you can share the podcast on social media, wherever you hang out. Don't forget, I have lots of young athlete resources on my website, jillcastle.com. Eat Like a Champion is the book I I authored in 2015, uh, is a great resource for feeding and nourishing the young athlete. I'm also developing an e-course by the same name for young athletes so that they themselves can take the course and learn and understand their own personal nutritional needs. That'll be available in early 2018. I also have free blog posts about the young athlete, a free snack handout for young athletes, and a couple of cookbooks for sale, one on feeding breakfast and another one on dinner ideas for that busy, busy rush hour time of day for young athletes. So head on over and brush up on your young athlete nutrition know-how today. As always, thanks for joining me. I'm so very glad you were here. Please be sure to give that child in your life, big or small, athlete or not, a loving squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.